Whoa, 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 where did you come from? Don't sneak up on me like that, it's terrifying. Anyways, anyway, today we're talking about stop motion animation. <laughs> I've loved stop motion and animation for longer than I can remember. It combines still photography and motion picture in a way like no other. Watching the behind the scenes for movies like James and the Giant Peach, Wallace and Gromit, and Star Wars, amongst many others, is what really inspired me to get into filmmaking. It is a super powerful tool for filmmaking because it can be used to make full movies or to enhance your live action narratives as a visual effect. So here's a brief history of how stop motion animation got its start. The first documented stop motion animated film is credited to J. Stuart Blackton and Albert E. Smith for the movie Humpty Dumpty Circus, which was released in 1898. The only surviving image is this one frame. The next person to really move the medium forward was named Vladislav Starwicks. He was most notably known for his first narrative short film titled Lacanus Service, which was made in 1910, and he used dead insects as puppets. Fast forward a few more years and you get to The Lost World in 1925, which was mind-blowing for its time, and later, from the same animator, one of filmmaking's biggest productions, King Kong in 1933. The art form of stop motion continued to get better alongside other techniques in filmmaking, even to the point where you could make motion blur on objects in stop motion. Unfortunately though, like every technique and tool, it won't be the best option forever. Though the use of stop motion to create full movies is still commonplace with large releases as recent as 2018 with Wes Anderson's Isle of Dogs, its use as a visual effect in live action is almost non-existent. In the 1990s, computers caught up to the point where it was less expensive to create characters digitally. The movie that was really the turning point for this was Jurassic Park. And as we know, that movie's effects still hold up today, which can't be said for a lot of CGI. So I think it's important to remember where all the movie magic started. So much of what we watch today on big movies and television come from the early days of stop motion. For me, it was the best way to start telling stories. As a child, I couldn't hire actors or get locations, so I used my Lego and my other toys, ha asked my dad to help me build a styrofoam set, used the family point-and-shoot camera, and used Windows Movie Maker, which, by the way, couldn't make a clip anything shorter than a full second long. So as you can see for stop motion, that's really, really janky. Unfortunately, most of my best work from childhood is lost because, you know, our family computer ended up dying after a long life of playing Hot Wheels and Stuart Little cereal box video games. These clips, however, were salvaged from a disc that was burned maybe 12 years ago. I think it was 2005 at a summer camp. Uh, we were learning flash animation and stop motion animation, so uh, it's actually crazy that I still have this disc. Go mom for cleaning out the garage. Not only has personal filmmaking technology gotten better, my understanding of filmmaking techniques has improved. So here's what I have to say about stop motion as I currently understand it. Making stop motion isn't that much different from making a normal film. The big difference is that you're doing it one frame at a time instead of with long takes. It might take you hundreds, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of frames to make up a full movie, so it can take such a long time to do it. Stop motion can, however, be as simple as animating clay on a table, or as complicated as building sets to scale and building motorized equipment to move either your camera or your subject through a scene. No matter how complicated the shot is, though, the fundamental aspects will remain the same. To get started with stop motion animation, first you need to understand frame rates. As you may know, movies are typically played back and recorded at a rate of 24 frames per second. This creates the illusion of movement since our eyes can't perceive the change in frame at fast succession. Stop motion uses this to its advantage and can be done at several frame rates, but the main three are animating on the ones, the twos, and the threes. Animating on ones means that for each second of animation there are 24 new drawings or adjustments to the character for each frame. This is used most often in action sequences or for any motion that needs to have a lot of detail or if you've got a really high budgeted movie. Animating on twos means that for each second of animation there are 12 new drawings or frames. This is the most common type of animation as it strikes a line between time saving and fluidity of motion. Uh, for me, I would say animating either at 10 frames per second or 12 frames per second is great as it keeps uh, you moving and you get to see results faster than you would at 24 frames a second. And finally, this brings us to animating on threes. This means that for each second of animation, there are eight new drawings or frames. 
This timing is good for slow scenes where your characters aren't moving a lot. So using any of these methods is recommended, but of course you can go in between any of the frame rates if you want to. For instance, the intro to this video was done at 10 frames a second, and this explains why the movement isn't entirely smooth with the tape and all the other objects in frame. This was intentional, however, for a time-saving and aesthetic purpose. Uh, that shot took an hour and a half to shoot, and I had to do it twice because I messed something up the first take. So just imagine how much more time it would have taken me to shoot that had I done it on 24 frames a second. This brings me to the second point of why certain videos are animated at different frame rates. If you're on a budget for both time and money, you're probably gonna have to be frugal with your frames. This is something to be considered in pre-production. I highly recommend you doing a storyboard or at the very least a shot list or even acting out the movements in the framing that you desire. It's gonna help you understand what move you're making so much better than if you were to just hold it all inside your head and try to get it out there. I first saw this done for Wes Anderson's Fantastic Mr. Fox. All the actors acted out the motions of the characters in live action, and this helped the animators to imbue more of the actor's performance into the puppet. Since scenes shot in stop motion take so long to create, performance changes or reshoots are probably not gonna be likely, so you have to pay a lot of attention to what you're doing while you're shooting. Any slight nudge of the set or the camera will cause issues in the final shot. When I'm shooting stop motion, I like to have my computer connected up to my camera so that I can trigger it remotely, change settings, and I can see my progress and do playback. And it also automatically saves photos to my SSD so I don't have to offload the photos from my camera at the end of the shoot. It's great to have this as an option and you can do it in either Lightroom or Imaging Edge if you're a Sony shooter, uh, as they do many of the same things. There's also specialized stop motion software, which I would highly recommend trying to do if you're gonna do stop motion. It gives you features like onion skinning, which allows you to preview the past photo over top of your current image, and it gives you options like letterboxing for different formats of movies. All of the features that you get with tethered capture are great, but you could just use the camera by itself. You will, however, be increasing the risk of nudging the camera since you'll be interacting with it more regularly. Regardless of whatever capture method you choose, the process of making it into an actual video is gonna be the exact same. Open your editor of choice and reduce the length of each photo to the frame rate desired and choose the correct project size. Many professional and prosumer cameras of today can take photos way bigger than 4K resolution, so this shouldn't be an issue. You could even shoot images in a 16 by 9 aspect ratio and save yourself the time of having to reframe and post. Not that I would want to make an animation of any great length this way, but if you were like me when I started and didn't have access to anything else, your phone can be a really good tool to start off with, especially since you can do the entire movie from one device. You'll still for sure need a couple of bits and pieces like a phone tripod to get the right kind of shot, but if you've got nothing else, this is a great way to get started doing stop motion animation. Making movies and stories is great and all, but what if you need to sell something? Well, stop motion is a great way for photographers to add something else to their portfolio. Since you can use continuous or strobe lighting for stop motion, you don't have to get all new gear. As the world becomes more video focused, this is one way you can add great value for your clients without a great deal of extra effort or cost. Now I couldn't get one of these for the video, but something I'd highly recommend that you get is a dummy battery for your camera or you connect your camera via its USB connection for power. You'll still need to have a battery in the camera, but this will extend the battery's life considerably. In the event that you are to lose battery power, if you weren't to use either of these options, Depending on what kind of structure your camera is connected to, you might not be able to access the battery door. So ha uh, having to take the camera off of whatever platform it's connected to could completely ruin the shot that you're doing and set you back hours, if not days, in production. So understanding what your power requirements are is gonna be really important. Being able to accurately and carefully manipulate the subject that you're shooting is also really important. So having something on set like sticky tack, double-sided tape, or even these soldering armatures, which allow you to record and manipulate uh, your subject is really important. So this video is really intended only to give you an introduction to the process of making stop motion video and to show you that the barrier to entry is very low. The main two things in my opinion that you need to start doing stop motion are time and imagination. Otherwise, there's not really a ceiling to what you can create with this medium. There are so many uses for stop motion, whether it be for full on movies or for commercial pieces uh, or to just add something else to an existing uh, campaign. It's really rewarding to bring inanimate objects to life so definitely give it a try. To see all the products featured in this video and to see anything else VizTech related please head to VizTech.ca to see what we've got going on. Thanks a lot and see you on the next one.